One God, by whose hand we are given new birth, by whose speaking we are given new life. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are welcomed, restored, and supported as citizens of the new creation. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. In mercy and might, you have freed us from death and raised us with Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. In baptismal waters, our old life is washed away, and in them we are born anew. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Honor to you for waters that wash us clean, quench our thirst, and nurture both crops and creatures. Praise to you for the life-giving water of baptism the outpouring of the spirit of the new creation. Wash away our sin and all that separates us from you. Empower our witness to your resurrection. Strengthen our resolve in seeking justice for all. Satisfy the world's need through this living water. Where drought dries the earth, bring refreshment. Where despair prevails, grant hope. Where chaos reigns, bring peace. We ask this through Christ, who with you and the Spirit reigns forever. Amen.
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. first reading is from Acts, the first chapter. Jesus had appeared to the disciples after his resurrection in several places, and the apostles had questions. So when the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, 
together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of the Lord.
The second reading is from 1 Peter, beginning at the fourth chapter. So Peter is trying to inspire the Christians that are in various groups in that area. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. alone and the disciples sleeping on a rock outside the garden. 
But instead, this prayer, they witness that Jesus is still sitting around the table with them, and he is praying this really beautiful and intimate prayer, and they are witnessing this prayer that Jesus is praying. And in the prayer, Jesus is even giving some instructions to the disciples as he prays. But one of the words that continues to come up is the word glory. Now, as usual, I've done this to Jim before, but I have, so I've had another path. I was going to go on more of the unity path when I sat and was thinking about my sermon on Wednesday. And then Jim asked the question in Bible study. So you can either thank him at the end of this, or you can give him a hard time. I'm sure he could find the either. But he asked the question of, what is glory? As we see in our gospel reading, glory come up six times in that gospel reading. In particular, in the first four verses, that glory is said five different times in there. And in that reading, we say, glory to God in the highest often. We sing songs that talk about glorifying God, or we sing glory to God. But how often have we actually sat together or in a sermon or in a conversation and really thought about what is glory? What does it mean to glorify God? And we even have the word glory written here in our sanctuary. Does anybody know where? Right back there. That's right, up on the organ. So it's in really big letters, too. It's not just teeny tiny, but written in really big letters. It says, glory to God in the highest, right behind you, too. So it's all around us, but what is glory? What does it mean to glorify God? And now I'm seriously asking you, I don't do this to you super often, but sometimes I like to hear what you think instead of me just telling you. I mean, I have some thoughts and I've read some commentaries that I'll tell you, but to start us, when you think of the word glory, what it means to glorify God, what comes in your mind? Praise. And what do you mean by praise? An act of praise, an act of thanksgiving, reverencing in some way. All right, very good. Anybody else? What do you think of when you think about glory or glorifying God? Yes. Exalted. Exalted. Say more about that. So when we, when we sing glory to God, we're kind of placing God in a higher place, maybe above ourselves and above, we're, we're placing priority maybe on God when we glorify God. Anybody else want to share? Yeah. Honor. Honor. Say more about that. What do you mean by honor? Yeah, so another way of uh, just kind of lifting up, making, and maybe priority is not a strong enough word, but it's what I'm, that we're placing God above all else in our, in our life and in our worship and in our community lives together. That, so honoring to you. Sue, did you raise your hand? Or did you? The Ascension. Yes, so you think about glory in terms of Jesus being kind of raised up, which this past week was Ascension. Um, and I had, we had the choice of reading the Ascension text or, what is it, the sixth or seventh Sunday, seventh Sunday of Easter. And I went this route because it all kind of ties to Ascension a bit too. So you have that, yeah, you kind of picture that, the picture. Hmm. So our ascension uh, photo and kind of the way the folks around are kind of in awe in that um, painting. Uh, they're, they're in awe of what's kind of happening. Anyone else when we glorify God? And what does it, what does glory mean? Where did that come from? Mm, glorifying God by acting as Christ would have us act 
in the world. So it's, it's also about our actions that we can maybe say that we honor God and we place God here, but it also means that we have to follow through on it. That it means that it actually has to shape our decisions and our actions and being Christ in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have to preach anymore. Great. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> done. All done. <laughs> but no, I mean, so now I'm trying to decide how far I want to go into my nerdy sphere of the Greek word doxa and all of that. Um, hmm. See, now you're getting me a little bit on the fly. This is a scary place. Um, but, but yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to glory, we see, I'm going to go a little bit here for all of you. In the Gospel of John, glory is in a particular way because the Gospel of John is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke in that those are the synoptic Gospels, more like kind of what actually happened. And the Gospel of John is this beautiful and confusing gospel with all of these different layers and every little piece has some kind of meaning to it. And so in the Gospel of John, glory also has a lot of different meanings underneath it too. And so it has to do with the way that God is made known in the world and to human beings. And so we see Jesus glorifying God with his actions by healing people, by teaching, by sitting at the table with sinners, by showing the power of God, Jesus is glorifying God through those things too. And then also we see in this prayer that Jesus is going to go to be with God and is going to continue to glorify God as well as there as he returns to kind of that heavenly glory that we see here with the ascension as well. Um, you know, one that I don't think we can fully understand what that exactly means yet, because I don't think our brains can take it in, but we live in that hope that one day we will experience the fullness of God's presence. And then also that Jesus, the way he ends the prayer too, that we will one day experience the fullness of God's love, and I think calls us to share that love and to continue to glorify God even after Jesus says, Jesus leaves as well. I mean, in some ways, I think this glory to God essentially comes down to the two big commandments, to love God and to love our neighbor in the best way we can. And sometimes glorifying God is done in big and bold ways and in really big and bold letters like they are here in our sanctuary. Sometimes it's about taking your whole life and reworking it and following a calling from God. And more often though than not, it's in those teeny tiny ways. It's writing a card to someone who you know is sick. It's about sharing your gifts with someone who's in need. It's about donating money because you know that you have more than enough and there's people who don't have enough food on their table. It's whenever we place God and God's people above ourselves that we are glorifying God. Martin Luther didn't, wasn't necessarily talking about glory here, but I think it gets at this point. He said the Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on his shoes, but by making good shoes, because God is interested in good craftsmanship. It makes me think about those bumper stickers you see around that says, keep Christ in Christmas. That's kind of on people's cars, which is great, and it's a great sentiment. But if all you have on your car is a bumper sticker that says, keep Christ in Christmas, but it doesn't shift the way that you move in the world and the decisions that you make, I think that's just putting a cross on your car, but not necessarily making good shoes, right? And so, I'm going to ask all of you a question again. But what are those little ways, and also those really big ways, that you bring glory to God, or you have witnessed others 
bring glory to God. Maybe in this community, maybe at your work, maybe within your family. Where have you seen those little ways and those really big ways bringing glory to God? This one's harder than the first day. Hmm? Listening. Listening. Yeah, say, say a little bit more what you mean by Yeah, so being present with someone and listening without necessarily feeling the need to fix or to give advice, but to just sit with someone in whatever they're going through, but to be fully present. Anyone else? Creative living community. Did that come from behind me again? <laughs> Say more about that. So Creative Living kind of, um, community that uh, is working to bring those who are marginalized um, and make sure that they know that they are valued and um, have a place in society and is working really to bring the marginalized in. Yeah. Well, I think um, when you utilize the gift that God has given you, you are praising it by going out whether it's doing it with friends, whether it's someone who loves crafts or creative things, sharing that with others, helping them learn how to do things, um, being, you know, or doing your everyday life in a way when even if you don't want to do something, you know that it needs to be done and you do it or you do it in time. given you, yeah. that you are glorifying God by whatever you end up doing in the day. Um, if that's washing a, a dish, if it's cooking dinner, if it's uh, doing a really great job teaching your middle school students and teaching them how to sing, whatever that is, doing, sharing your gifts throughout your every day. Anybody else? Yes. Well, whatever that ends up being. Jim, I'm picking on you again. You're going to really like come after me after this. But it makes me think of Jim. And Jim talked about how he, you know, he worked. Well, I want to hear more about being an actuarial. I didn't even think I said that right. But anyway, I didn't. Um, but he does taxes for folks who are in need because that's something that he's gifted at. That and doing those taxes well for people is exactly what this it's all those little, those little pieces when we're out in the world. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that we cure someone who isn't able to walk 
to be able to walk again. What it's about doing our every day in a, in a good way that puts God first in our lives and that we do the very best that we can. And I think the important part of it too is sometimes to remind one another in this community of the things that each of us are doing. And that it doesn't necessarily mean, I think sometimes we think that you have to be like a nun or a pastor in order to do God's work. But I'll end with another piece that Martin Luther said. He said that changing the diaper of a child is doing God's work in the same way that the monk is doing God's work. Because you're doing it for the goodness of that child. So everything that you do, I hope this week that you do it from the glory of God. And that also, you share with one another those ways that you see the glory of God. Thanks for participating in my participatory sermon this morning. And thank you, Tim, for letting me keep saying your name. <laughs> Amen.
United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of harmony, as we draw your son to your side, you draw us to you and unite us with the planet and one another. Weave your church together in a web of mutual love for the sake of the world. Hear us, O oh God. As your spirit hovered over the waters of creation, so your spirit hovers over all that you have made. Bless the water that sustains the planet and grant wisdom to use it wisely. Hear us, O oh God. You empower your people with the fire of your spirit. Challenge activists and organizers, teachers and politicians, and all in leadership to speak a message of peace and justice. Hear us, O oh God. We give thanks that humankind serves as your body in the world. Jordan, your abundant gifts, give this congregation and its leaders and staff as they help guide us to seek your will. Hear us, O God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.
If you do come up to receive communion at the altar rail, please wait until everybody has received and you receive a blessing, and you can go back to your seat by way of the two side aisles on whichever side of the altar rail you are on. So we have, uh, well, the rest is in your bulletin, but no, the most important part is that you are welcome here. If this is your first time or your 500th time at receiving communion, know that you are welcome at this table of grace. Come and know Christ broken and poured out for you. Amen.
God of all who raised Jesus from the dead, bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the new creation. Amen.